Okay, we're back at VMworld 2011 for day four. My name is John Furrier with SiliconAngle.tv and SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org. Uh, this is day four, John, pretty amazing. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and we're here with Paul Frutan, who is the CTO of Nirvonix, the cloud storage innovator. Uh, Paul, former Google exec, um, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. So you're at Google. Google obviously um, is in the forefront of everything. They've been dominating the world for the past you know, decade in terms of search, but data centers and infrastructure, they're massive. You know, Facebook is now nipping at their heels, massive scale. Um, the question I have is, uh, you were responsible for a ton of stuff. Tell us at Google, what did you do there? I mean, what was the scope? Well, my org was responsible for uh, operating all the production servers. So all the machines that we had around the world that served the various Google applications and all the back-end stuff. We put them up, took care of them while they were alive, and then took them down and disposed of them later on when it was done. And you guys grew like crazy. Over the course of your career at Google, how many data centers did you guys build out? Uh, we announced uh, five or six data centers, I believe, uh, while I was there. Uh, very, very large data centers. I mean, uh, these are multiple hundreds of million dollars a piece, big scale. So we covered uh, the news when you left Google and went to Nirvonix, really fast, hot growing startup in cloud storage. So cloud storage is all the rage. Why Nirvonix? I mean, so what attracted you to Nirvonix? Well, you know, Google's full of a lot of smart people and if you uh, spend a little bit of time there, you can learn a lot. And I like to think that I did learn a lot about big infrastructure, big scale, and, and uh, how it all works together. I uh, saw a company like Nirvonix, uh, seen them for a couple of years, I followed their moves, and I just thought they had a very unique product. They've been around business in, uh, for, for a while, so and they have some good customers. And uh, it, for uh, someone like me, I discovered that I'm actually more passionate about kind of a s smaller startup environment, and uh, Nirvana seemed like a great fit for uh, to make a difference. So, so we've been on the Cube here. This is our fourth day. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out and talk to everyone, Pat Gelsinger, all the top executives uh, here at VMware, around the industry, bloggers, VCs, and everyone's all jazzed about cloud. And Nirvana is obviously in the cloud business with cloud storage, but the the, the thread that's been kind of going through the cube here is that this is the year of winners and losers, okay? The demand is high for products, so, so what's your take on the cloud space, winners and losers, and what's going to be the key uh, kind of variable that makes the winners kind of tip over? Uh, uh, so the way I look at it, it, it seems like people are finally understanding and realizing what is cloud and what isn't. Uh, you can't take a box traditionally, it's been around for 20 years, and we sell it as X, Y, or Z, put a cloud label on it and call it a cloud and that's been going off for some time now. It's the hot thing everyone wants to jump on. And, but then there are some actual cloud uh, uh, products out there. And finally, after so much time, people are understanding what, which are real and which ones are not. And the ones that are real and have a good product will stay. The other ones will, will either go away or go back to their traditional markets. Paul, what are the storage implications of uh, true cloud and machines at scale? Well, well, the storage implications of this true cloud, this real cloud, and, right. and machines at scale? So probably the, the easiest, uh, the, the most impactful thing of it is the end user doesn't have to worry about it. That's what cloud's supposed to be, is the end user puts the data in and forgets about it. It's to all handled inside the cloud, the replication is, DR is, uh, having number of different copies of the data, ensuring data integrity, ensuring data availability, is all handled by the cloud. And the user shouldn't have to worry about it. That's what, what the real piece is. You shouldn't have to go and buy a ton of machines, figure out how to put it together, how to architect the entire infrastructure. This is all supposed to be handled by the cloud. Now, at Google, you had a, a bunch of PhDs running around to figure all that stuff out. You have to, first of all, what can you, what can you learn from that you, that you can bring to Nirvonix, and, and how do you replicate that? Because you don't have an army of, of PhDs. I'm sure you have some, sure. not, not nearly as many. So how do you take what you did at, at Google and that concept and, and enterpriseize it, if you will, and package it? Sure, so uh, the, the Google model is a little bit different in the sense that uh, at scale, even some of the largest companies aren't anywhere near that side of scale. What's nice about having worked in that environment is you, you see all the problems that you are likely to encounter in the next 10 years as, as storage and everything grows. And uh, once you know what to encounter, you can take the right steps now to make sure that those are addressed uh, when, when they come along. In terms of the enterprise, I mean, we can bring that, we can look at all the positive aspects of it, and how you do it without 100 PhDs by focusing on one piece, right? Nirvana's just cloud storage, that's what I like about it. Not, not compute, not a bunch of different products, we do cloud storage, that's all we do, and that's how we can be good at it. One of the things that we've been hearing again in theCUBE this week, um, this is the best part of going on day four, you get to get all the, the, uh, the data from the marketplace, but it's, it's, uh, we've, been, we've been talking, Dave and I have been talking about the demand right now is so strong for cloud that it kind of put, puts in check the hype. 
right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Google, obviously, that's great. when you were at Google, there was no debate. They were growing fast. So there was no, like, you know, pie in the sky plans. They had to deliver value in building out the data center. So talk about what you see at Nirvana, because you guys have real customers. You guys are delivering cloud storage. What is your plan at Nirvana on your build out? What's your strategy and kind of what are you thinking? So we're looking at all the all the important aspects of the cloud, be it, uh, being the incremental growth ability, the the pay for what you use, uh, having the the replication, the access, and data integrity, and looking at how can we continue to bring it to the customers more efficiently, faster, and cheaper. Right? That's that's where where we need to take this is to make all the great benefits available to them at a reasonable cost, at the right performance that they need. And uh, we actually have a couple of interesting things that are coming up soon and uh, they'll, they'll really make a difference in the market. We already are the only company that will do private, public, and a hybrid cloud in the real sense that we can actually bring the cloud to you. We make you part of our cloud in the hybrid sense. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a very key piece uh, uh, product that we have, and we're going to expand that and, and do more with it. So following up on that, Doug, I mean, they think a cloud, you think a cloud is cheap and deep. Um, and, and that's, you're not, you're semi-cheap and deep. Um, so is that right, and, 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 and how do you add value beyond that just, okay, I want to put it in S3 or just put it out there in the cloud? Sure. And uh, you touched upon that a little bit with the, right. the public and private. I wonder if you could expand on that. All right, so, so uh, one of the things that, that we'll soon start discovering, the market will soon discover, start discovering that not all clouds are the same. Right, we, call, we talk about storage and, and it's kind of all thrown in the bucket, but it's not all the same. And it is not just about cheaps. There are actual different features that different clouds have. For example, our cloud has data consistency. None of the other ones do. S3 doesn't, OpenStack doesn't, others don't. Just as an example of a feature that we have that they don't. The hybrid piece is another piece that we offer that they don't. So it is not just about that. So you take those things and then you combine it with enterprise level support. We have phone numbers, we have texts that will answer your call. If there's problems, we can address it. If there's customization to be done, we can do that. If there are, there are a number of partners, many of them here, that needs to be uh, worked with these guys to make the, the entire user experience better. And we do all those things, whereas a lot of these other ones don't. Okay, so, so you can get a premium for that and, and presumably make a profit at that. And, and who do you, I mean, I don't really see anybody else going hard after that business. I mean, I presume it's kind of a traditional uh, uh, service providers. Maybe it's maybe it's IBM and HP and 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 maybe Oracle eventually. But there's really nobody else that's specializing in that that I see. What, what, is that right? Uh, or why is that? Uh, it certainly seems that way. Uh, why is it? Uh, well, the simplest answer is because it's hard. Uh, you know, if it was easy, they would be doing it, but it's not. I think a lot of these companies are looking at trying to do something like that, and as soon as they get down the road, they realize it's not its not that easy. You just can't take six boxes, stick them together, and call the cloud. As soon as you get your first customer and they start asking you questions about, about billing and, and shared tenancy and all that stuff, you run into a problem. So we're actually now working with a lot of these partners to help them set up these clouds, either for their internal use or for them to use for their customers. So EMC has kind of an interesting example. I wonder if we could talk about that. I mean, essentially they got Atmos, which is, um, you know, it's a box, you install it, you pay up front for it, but they partner with cloud service providers, it's an object store, they, they, they essentially their, their messaging is very similar in terms of scale and, and the number of objects you can support and so forth. So can they compete with that sort of virtual integration with their cloud service providers? Do you see that as sort of your biggest competitor? Um, it, it, is, it is an interesting product, it's a good product for some uses. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest products, like you just mentioned, first you have to go buy this huge box, which you may or may not use. You don't know how you will use it, because you don't up front know how much fast storage you need, how much slow, slow storage you need. There's a cost issue. And then the global object store, right? In our cloud, you put something in one location, it is the same object everywhere around the world all the time. And uh, from what I know from Atmos, that's not the case. It is, it is in, in pieces that you have the Atmos box, but globally, anywhere in the world, from any connection on the internet, it's not all the same. Paul, I got to ask you because um, it's one of my favorite terms on the planet right now, is, well, for a while, cloud washing, right? So we've been talking about, uh, obviously, on the, real, on the reality of the marketplace, there's demand. There's real people spending money, investing dollars for real products, and you got uh, new initiatives like OpenStack, Citrix just bought cloud.com, which has been doing some good work. So you have people racing to the market with solutions. So two things, talk about cloud washing. Who's out there cloud washing in your opinion? And two, talk about the viability of say OpenStack, for example. Sure, so uh, 
You know, I don't want to start naming names and cloud washing because uh, we're in this area and I might get beat up before I walk out of the door here. Uh, They're all but, here. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, a, a lot of them are out there, right? These are companies that are that are taking the same products that have existed for some time now, that which are all some kind of... Hold on, let me, let me ask you differently. Sure. How does someone smell test cloud washing? How do you see, what's cloud washing? How do you spot it? What's, the, what's an indicator? Uh, if, if, the, if the exact same product's been around for 20 years, it's probably not cloud. If, uh, if, you don't, if you have to buy a whole bunch of stuff up front and set it up yourself, it's probably not a cloud. If, uh, if you don't have a, a global consistent object store, it's probably not a cloud. Uh, so those are all you know, simple tests that we can see if it's cloud or not. Okay, so talk about OpenStack. They have a lot of momentum right now and they're getting a lot of developers jumping on board. And developers want trust. They want to make sure that they have an environment. And I like OpenStack. I love the initiative concept. Uh, kind of reminds me of the client server days when you know, all these new standards kind of you know, groups came together. But the question is, can they deliver fast enough? And, and what's your angle on uh, OpenStack? Um, I like OpenStack too. I think, again, it's an interesting pro uh, product. I think they did a good job of open sourcing it and getting the community involved. Uh, it, the OpenStack has both a computer and a storage side, and they're not the same product. They came from different places, and they're at different stages of their development. Uh, I actually think probably their computer side is probably further ahead than their, their storage side. But it's not all the same. We talked earlier about the different features. OpenStack's different than, than what we do. It will work for some customers, just like S3 will work for some customers. It won't work for some customers. And there are specific features of Nirvanix, uh, that, like, like the global object store, the consistency, that actually appeal more or work better in an enterprise environment, plus the service side, right? Rackspace, who sponsors OpenStack, would be the first one to tell you about how important service is. And something like Nirvanix, our cloud, we stand behind it, there's a company that will support you. You deploy an open source project, much like any other open source project, you're pretty much on your own to figure it out, unless you can get some of the, the community to happen to like the feature that you're looking for. Do you, uh, can you talk to the specific technical limitations of the, the storage, the object store of, of OpenStack? Have you taken a close enough look at that at this point? Um, I haven't gotten way deep into it. Uh, uh, OpenStack, like, like uh, most of the other uh, large distributed file system, has eventual consistency, for example. Uh, they have a file size limit. Uh, I think that's still around five, five gigabytes. So just take that as a simple problem. Many of our large customers have much bigger files than that, and now they, it's, it'll be. What are you guys doing? What, what are you guys doing for file size? You guys at Nirvana. You guys have a well, lot. It's of, unlimited. We yeah, have unlimited. unlimited files. So what does that uh, break it down? What does that mean for a, for a customer? Well, so uh, you take a large customer that may want to store movies, right? Uh, original movies or whatever, and, and the cloud. These are multi, multiple hundreds of gigabytes, right? And they want to push it out to the cloud. Once they get it on the cloud, then it exists in a number of different places. It, the DR is taken care of. They can access it from anywhere, and they can use it to distribute to other studios, customers, et cetera, that they have. That's not possible when you have to do small chunks. You have to figure out how are you going to divide it up. You have to figure out how do you recombine it, and when it's stored, how do you ensure the integrity of each one of those pieces? So my question is, you mentioned there's a lot of people potentially here cloud washing, but this VM world and VMware ecosystem's developing, right? So virtualization is now evolving. What, you, what are you guys doing here at VMworld and with in virtualization, how are you guys using it uh, in, your, in your build plan? Uh, so uh, our product, I think, works very well with, uh, with VMware, uh, with products like Veeam and, and uh, Commvault and others back up because we can take snapshots, for example, uh, virtual machine disks that exist. You can push that up to the cloud both for, for uh, DR purposes, for backups, and also for distribution. You have a, a, a virtual machine image that you may want to distribute with, uh, to a number of your offices. You put that up in the cloud, they go pick it up, and you always have a copy there available to you in case something happens. Or, uh, for example, if you want to uh, do troubleshooting, you take that, you push it up to the cloud, someone else picks it up, looks at it, they, uh, they do whatever they need to, they push it back yeah, into yeah. the cloud distribution. So, so it's all there. So your CEO, Scott Genero, who was on theCUBE on a panel, mentioned you guys have hundreds of clients, customers. Um, what, are the, what are the main things that they're doing in the cloud with you guys? What's the, you know, what are the core apps? What, what's, why are they going to you guys? Because that's a pretty impressive number. I mean, you gotta, I mean, not a lot of people can say, boast, we're real cloud and we have hundreds and hundreds of customers. Uh, we, we have an array of, di of different uh, uses that, that customers have. They are using it for DR purposes, they're using it for backup, they're using it for archiving, they're using it for di distribution of data. So we have a number of different customers and, and, and uh, so I, I, I can't tell you exactly one big application of it, but all of these things are being used. In, all in the above. Our... Okay, final question, we're getting the one minute hook here. Um, obviously at Google you have, working with a ton of smart people, they really pioneered modern data centers. So that makes a good cloud. What lessons did you learn from Google that you're going to take to Nirvanix? Uh, and what things do you see coming in forward to you that, that might be cool things to take your, get your arms around? 
Uh, so probably the, the, the most important things I learned is uh, hire very smart people and don't compromise and uh, go big, right? Uh, you, you make things big and, and uh, reach for the skies because uh, if you try, you might actually get those things done. Okay. All right, Paul Frutan, CTO of Nirvonics. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great guest. Love to have you back you. sometime. Great. Absolutely. And uh, stay right there, everybody. Uh, we're going to actually keep it going. And uh, thanks again, Paul. Uh, we've got uh, another.